All right, so uh, I'm going to start off, and again, some of the things that uh, uh, Juan mentioned in terms of the trends that are going on, some of the changing demographics, uh, the looking at the future of Texas and so forth, are going to be reflected in the comments that I will be making. A little bit in terms of looking at the uh, significance of, uh, of children, uh, when we think about uh, social, economic, political uh, conditions, and that is that the relative size of, uh, of a population uh, consisting of children, for example, reflects current population trends. For example, whether there are high levels of fertility, low levels of fertility, how fast the population is growing, and so forth. And then, very importantly, the, uh, the size of the uh, children population also portends changes that are going to be coming with respect to a, a, a given population. In addition, in issues uh, involving uh, human rights, for example, social justice, and so forth, quality of life often reflects uh, the societal treatment uh, of, uh, of the children population, as well as the overall well-being and benefit of, uh, of children in, in the community. If we look at the, the state of Texas, we can also see that there is a significance of uh, Texas here, the second largest uh, state in the country, and uh, very much increasingly so what we've seen uh, has been the nat national trends are being driven increasingly disproportionately by Texas. As uh, Gail Collins uh, recently wrote in her book, uh, As Texas Goes, uh, How the Lone Star State... Okay. Her book that just uh, came out recently, As Texas uh, Goes, How the uh, uh, Lone Star State Hijacked the American Agenda. Uh, so we see this, uh, this influence that Texas has been having. And this is particularly the case when it comes to the demographic changes taking place in, uh, in the United States. So let's take a look first at, at the national terrain. And we can see here, these are the, the 10 states, for example, that experienced the greatest absolute change in the children population between 2000 and 2010. Uh, and you can see Texas was at the top of the list here, with Texas about a million additional children that were added to the, uh, to the state's population. Overall in the country, there were about two million uh, uh, children that were added to the population. So you can see Texas, the power that it had, about 51% of the overall national growth in the children population occurred here in the state of Texas. Then you can see the other states, Florida, Georgia, North Carolina, Arizona, Utah, Nevada, Colorado, Virginia, and Tennessee. And one of the things that, that is reflected in these particular states is that many of these are states that have large, <coughs> significant Latino populations, or there are these new destination areas in the South, for example, that have experienced tremendous growth of the, uh, of the Latino population. And then we can look at the percentage change uh, in the children population over the 2000 to 2010 period. And you can see, again, these are the 10 states with the greatest increase. Many of these are new destination areas for Latinos. You can see Texas, 17.5% increase during the, the, uh, the decade, uh, ranked number four. Nevada, Utah, Arizona, North Carolina, Idaho, Georgia, Colorado, uh, Florida, and South Carolina. Again, very much you can see the presence of Latinos and, and the influence in these particular areas. Um, increasingly, what we've been seeing is a, is a movement towards minority-majority states with respect to, uh, to the children population. And we can see, for example, uh, in, uh, in the year 2000, there were uh, six states where um, uh, whites accounted for less than 50% of children, uh, District of Columbia, Hawaii, New Mexico, California, Texas, and Arizona. By 2010, you can see that there were uh, an additional five states, so now we have 11 states. Every year, we're going to be increasing the number of states that are going to be minority majority states. Now let's take a look at a uh, focus on Texas and the population change, changes that are going on in, uh, in Texas. In Texas, you can see the total here, uh, what took place over the last decade, the population increased by about a million. This is a, a slightly different data set and a time period, but about a 17% increase. But you can see that of that million people that were added to the uh, Texas population, Almost all of them, 931,000, were Latinos. So you can see about 95% of the overall growth in the uh, state's ch child population was due to growth in the Latino population. And just as demographers have been projecting a few decades ago, we can see the decline that has already taken place with respect to the white population and the, uh, the child uh, population in, in the state. 
So we can see then the, the, uh, the increasing share of the ch child population in Texas that is Latino, going from 40.5 in, in 2000 to 48% in uh, 2010. The decline that has taken place among whites from 43% to about a third, and then very stable in the African American population. And here you can see uh, with respect, these are for each age groups down at the bottom, zero to all the way to age 17. Then you have the relative share for uh, Latinos are in blue, uh, whites in, in red. And you can see that in each of these age groups, you can see the majority of uh, the population is, uh, is uh, Latino, uh, all the way from uh, 17 years of age where you have about 44% of, uh, of these individuals being Latino compared to about 30 7% or so uh, whites, and in the last few, probably by about age four, over 50% of the, of the uh, population of those ages are, are Latino. Now let's take a look at the family and households in which uh, Latino and, uh, and other children live. And for the most part, if you look at the white population on the, on the right there, you're talking about more of the traditional kind of family of yesteryear, although we've seen those changes taking place. So about 72% of white children, for example, are living in, in uh, homes with a mother and f uh, a husband and a wife. Uh, and then with Latinos, about 58%. And then African Americans kind of split between that, that uh, husband, wife, family, and then uh, families headed by, by uh, females. Uh, then this particular chart looks at all families in Texas by race and ethnicity. And then the percentage that has children that, uh, that are female-headed households. And you can see, again, close to half of African-American families and with children uh, um, uh, are headed by, by, uh, by women. Poverty, poverty issues is a big uh, play, play here. And these are data from the American Community Survey for 2012. And you can see uh, African-American and Latino children being about three times more likely to be poor compared to, uh, to white children and particularly with Latinos, 35% uh, uh, poverty rate. And you can see here that, again, family, the family structure also uh, makes a difference. So, for example, in red, you can see homes where there's, for the most part, a single earner, uh, female uh, householder. Uh, for, for Latinas, 52% uh, of such families are in poverty. Uh, African Americans, 44%, and 28.5% for, uh, for whites. Now, one of the major differences that you see is the gap, for example, or the, the uh, poverty rates for married couples. And you can see for whites and for blacks, it tends to be relatively low. But for the Latino population, we're talking about one in five being, uh, being poor. So the whole thing that marriage protects individuals from, pro from poverty, that, that uh, accrual doesn't seem to be coming uh, to fruition in the case of, uh, of the Latino population. Education, just very quickly, one of the major issues that has taken place with respect to Latino children is the lack of enrollment uh, prior to entering kindergarten. Uh, and here you can see tremendous change at age three, for example, in blue, you can see that only 18% of Latino children uh, three years of age are enrolled compared to 30% for blacks and 37% for whites. And you can see some improvement by age four, but again, those disparities continue to exist. And they exist particularly for poor kids. So that Latino, Latino poor kids here, for example, uh, at 12.5%, among poor, ki poor Latino kids that are three years of, of age, only 12.5% are enrolled in school compared to about uh, um, 47%, uh, uh, excuse me, 21.8% uh, uh, for Latino kids that are, that are not poor. So you can see then that poverty plays a major, a major role here. Just some general characteristics here, looking at uh, uh, teenage uh, pregnancy. Uh, Texas is a leader in this, uh, in this particular uh, dimension, and we can see here the percent of girls 15 to 17 years of age who gave birth in the previous year. You can see that uh, Latina uh, girls about 3.6%, uh, so close to 4%, versus about 0.9% for white girls. And this, of course, has severe consequences for the future because once uh, uh, kids have a, a child early on, 
the probability of being in poverty continues to exist and uh, dramatically increase. And you can see the, the uh, dropout kind of rates for 17-year-olds, the lack of insurance that Anne will be talking about, but particularly for, for uh, Latino kids, it's almost a fifth uh, that are children having no insurance. The unemployment rates, so that for kids then having that experience of being in the labor force, Many kids, particularly Latino and African Americans, African Americans, a 62% unemployment rate. Uh, and then you also see the disability that exists uh, that is relatively high for Latino and African American kids. Health matters here, uh, the in infant mortality rate, you can see some of the differences that take place, and some surprises having to do with the Latino population. So with the, uh, excuse me, this should be the, uh, the black population. Uh, and these two should be switched over. So uh, blacks have the, uh, the infant mortality rate of 11 uh, per 1,000 births. Uh, blacks and Latinos are relatively similar at 5.5. This is the paradox that, uh, that epidemiologists talk about, the uh, Latino paradox that despite being very poor, the population tends to do relatively well with respect to mortality. And you see this with respect to uh, um, life expectancy. Uh, life expectancy is the highest for Latinos and Latinas despite having high levels of poverty, low levels of education, low levels of health insurance, and so forth. On the other hand, uh, with a black population, it tends to be much lower. And again, a paradox that we can talk about uh, as uh, time permits. So the future of Texas, increasingly very clear. Uh, the future of Texas is increasingly made up of uh, people of color, especially Latinos and decreasingly a white population. Uh, just as uh, Gail Collins has talked about, as Texas goes, so does the rest of the, rest of the nation. Here, as, as the go Latinos and, and African Americans, so goes uh, uh, Texas. And uh, as uh, Juan pointed out, we've seen very clearly that children and their education and preparation uh, has not been a top state priority. Uh, and in fact, very much short-term thinking and a lot of politics that also has gotten involved here. And again, very, uh, there's a clear need to see Latino and African American kids not as liabilities, but rather an asset, as assets uh, uh, in terms of investing in their future. The reality is with these demographic changes, the Latino population and African American populations, per, persons of color, increasingly are going to impact the different institutions. Just like baby boomers impacted each of the institutions as they went through, the, through their lives and now are impacting the healthcare as they're reaching retirement age, so too will you see Latinos, for example, uh, children of color impacting who's going to be the military, uh, the people fighting wars, for example, who are going to be the consumers, the workforce, people who are going to be entering higher education. Uh, the, the voters, for example, the candidates, who are going to be the healthcare workers and so forth. Religious institutions, as you see, these demographic shifts, you also see uh, uh, different denominations recruiting, Latinos and other groups, housing, all of these are going to be impacted. Uh, but what we've seen is, rather than trying to groom and prepare Latinos for the future, what we've seen is really critical roadblocks trying to block their progress block their, their potential political uh, uh, empowerment. We've seen this with the anti-state and local uh, anti-immigrant uh, policies, the attack on affirmative action, bilingual education, cuts to public school education, uh, the booming incar incarceration of people of color, political redistricting as well as voter ID. All of these then affected, uh, affecting the Latino population in particular and African Americans and again, strategies that have been used to try to minimize the political power of these particular uh, groups. So the big issues and the critical issues in terms of preparing better uh, Latinos and African Americans and other uh, uh, people of color, we have to deal with issues such as the criminal justice system, the whole thing with the school to uh, prison pipeline that has become increasingly prevalent, particularly with the privatization of prisons and the mon money that is being made, the educational issues that are going on, dropouts and push-out rates, the health disparities that continue to exist, particularly lack of access to health care, immigration issues where you have deportations, massive deportations uh, uh, that are splitting families apart, 
jobs that continue to, uh, where we have a lot of people near poor or poor that continue to hold full-time full jobs without the benefit of getting out of poverty, and then the whole issue of voting and, and representation, which we continue to see as, uh, as barriers in, in, in the community. And with that, I'll, I'll finish and uh, pass that Thank on. You.